Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. When Lamech was 182, he had a son. Lamech said, I'll name him Noah because he will give us comfort as we struggle hard to make a living on this land that the Lord has put under a curse. Lamech had more children and died at the age of 777. After Noah was 500 years old, he had three sons and named them Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Genesis chapter 5 verses 28 through 32 Contemporary English Version But first you must realize that in the last days some people won't think about anything except their own selfish desires. They will make fun of you and say, Didn't your Lord promise to come back? Yet the first leaders have already died and the world hasn't changed a bit. They will say this because they want to forget that long ago the heavens and the earth were made at God's command. 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 3 through 5 Contemporary English Version Hi, I'm Victoria K. Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. Today we want to continue our discussion series that we're calling The Truth in Genesis. And to help us do that, we've invited one of the premier scientists and experts on the question of origins, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, to be our guest in the studio for the next several weeks. Dr. Sarfati has sold hundreds of thousands of books, such as Refuting Evolution, Volumes 1 and 2, By Design, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, and The Genesis Account. During this series, Dr. Sarfati will be addressing a wide variety of topics that are pertinent to the question of the origin of the Earth and the universe. During the series, he will be providing us with insight into the extensive body of scientific evidence that supports the truth of Genesis text. Along the way, he will be addressing a number of subjects, including problems with conventional dating methods, affirmative evidence that the universe is actually fairly young, scientific challenges to life arising from non-living chemicals, and evidence that the Earth's surface provides abundant evidence of a worldwide flood. In our last episode, we learned that, contrary to many claims, the text of Genesis is actually very clear that God created the entire Earth and universe in just six normal 24-hour days. We are well aware that this position is at odds with the claims of contemporary culture. Yet, surprisingly enough, there's an enormous body of empirical observations that reinforces the Bible's declaration and refutes the cultural consensus. But before we get too far into our discussion, Dr. Sarfati, would you like to say a word of greeting to the Anchored by Truth listeners and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and Creation Ministries International? Well, good day. Thank you again for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be on Anchored by Truth. What a great station this is. Now, I come from Creation Ministries International. Our website is creation.com. We've been going for 40 years now. I actually am from Australia and New Zealand. I'm a, I was a dual national from those countries, but I'm also now an American citizen too, as of September 2019. I'm a PhD scientist. I studied chemistry and physics. I've been working for Creation Ministries for over 20 years now. I'm also a retired chess champion of New Zealand a while back. My job today is actually writing books and articles and giving talks in churches around the country, showing why Genesis is extremely important to understand the rest of the Christian faith, as well as how it makes perfect scientific sense. When you understand the real science, Genesis really provides a huge number of insights. As I mentioned in our last episode of Anchored by Truth, you addressed why the Genesis text actually rules out the possibility that God performed his work of creation in six successive stages of indeterminate duration. 
Would you mind briefly reminding our listeners of the major points that were made? Well, certainly. Well, first of all, just the text itself. The days of creation have evening and morning and number. So God is making it extremely clear what sort of days he's talking about. And then if that's not clear enough, when he gave the Ten Commandments, he told us what days of creation meant because they were a pattern for our working week. We work for six days, rest for one, because God works six days and rested for one. So he's told us what he meant by Genesis 1. It's a pattern for our week. So there must be ordinary 24-hour days and consecutive days as well. No gap allowed. And I also showed you how Paul himself, when he gave his gospel resurrection message in 1 Corinthians 15, he linked the death and resurrection of Jesus for our sin with Adam committing a sin and bringing death into the world. Paul makes that connection extremely clear. We have also, he says, the wages of sin is death. Thank you. That was very helpful. It's so important to be very clear about a proper understanding of the opening verses of Genesis. It is essential because any other view of the creative period would require the existence of animal and human death before Adam's sin. This would undermine God's declaration of the unspoiled creation being very good. It would also undermine the clear link scripture makes between sin and death. And there is no good reason for Christians to attempt to fit scripture into a framework that sees the universe as being ancient as opposed to being young, is there? Well, if you try to fit scripture into this long age scenario, you're actually stretching it past the breaking point because you're stretching, you're, you're totally disconnecting the whole issue of sin from death if you do that. Because if you have millions of years, you have the rock layers forming over millions of years, but those rock layers contain fossils. And that means that when God made the Garden of Eden and called everything very good, it means this Garden of Eden sitting on a pile of bones miles deep which show evidence of human and animal death and suffering and disease. You've got gout, osteoporosis, you have bone cancer. And then God says everything here is very good. So what do you call very bad if bone cancer is very good, I'd like to know. So it undermines the goodness of God when you try to do this. Now, I'm not saying you're not a Christian if you believe in long age. I don't say that, but I'm saying there's a huge logical disconnect you have to make in your mind to try and combine the two. So let's expand on the basic point that you're making. Conventional dating methods have fatal flaws that compromise their reliability for assigning dates to the distant past. Well then, what are the most common methods used to assign dates to geological and paleontological phenomena and materials? Now, first of all, the long ages came about before any of these dating methods were invented. The whole point of a long age idea was a bit over 200 years ago, you have the period called the Endarkament. Well, they call it the Enlightenment. I don't, okay? Where they rejected divine revelation. They decided we have to think about what's happening today to explain the past. They rejected a global flood of judgment, okay? So instead, we have to look at processes happening today, which are very slow and gradual. And then you say, well, to get the rocks we see, it takes millions of years of these slow and gradual processes to form these rock layers with all the fossils in there. And nowadays, most people think of radiometric dating, but that was about 100 years after people had already made it in minds that the Earth was very old because of their preconception that there wasn't a global flood and no special creation. But radioactive dating would be the most common method that are used now. What problems are present in these dating methods? Well, the problems involved with all dating methods is that, first of all, you have to know the starting point. You see, the radio to dating method is actually measuring amounts of chemicals in rocks or other sorts of samples. It's actually not measuring age, it's measuring amounts of stuff. So before you can work out age, you have to know how much stuff was there to begin with. The other thing is you have to make sure that nothing else got in or out of the system you're trying to measure. And a third thing, you have to assume that the process you're considering has been at a constant rate this whole time. I mean, you can think of this like filling a bath. Your bath is, say, got 10 gallons of water in there, and the tap is flowing at, say, 2 gallons a minute. So how long did it take to fill the bath? You might say, well, divide 10 by 2, you get 5. But what if I sort of turn the tap down a bit to avoid overflowing? 
but it was actually much faster in the past. You see, you won't know the difference. And also, what if I started half full? I mean, you assume I started empty, but I didn't tell you that, you see. I actually started half full. And what if there's a small leak, the plug isn't working, so there's drainage out the back there, out down the plug, you see. That would also spoil how long uh, you estimated it took the bath to fill. That's a dating method. And the same thing applies to all the dating methods invoked by long-age scientists. They all had three assumptions. Initial conditions, that it's a closed system with nothing else getting in or out, and that the rate is constant. Are there examples of ancient dates that were assigned to rocks of known recent origin? Well, see, one reason we can know when a rock was formed, if people saw it form. Now, back in one of my home countries of New Zealand, there's a volcano called Ngodohoi, which actually you might know as Mount Doom from the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay, and so they know there were some lava flows uh, from the 1950s, which form solid rock. So we know when the rock was formed, 1950s. And then they took these rocks to the radioactive dating labs and tried different dating methods. And they all gave dates of millions and even billions of years for rocks we know were only 50 years old at the time of measurement. And furthermore, not were the dating methods totally wrong, but they disagreed among themselves. But when they tell you the dating method, they tell you there's a certain error limit, uncertainty in it. But these dates were different, way past the uncertainty limit there. So clearly, there's a lot of exaggeration there. And of course, we know they were wrong anyway, because we saw the rock form. So the point is, if we can't trust it on rocks of known age, why should we trust it on rocks of unknown age? In what way does Genesis Flood account provide a better explanation for the existence of an ice age than conventional ideas about geology and climatology. Okay, one of the best evidences of Noah's flood, a global flood, is the fact that Earth has gone through an ice age, and only the flood provides a good explanation for the ice age. Here are the issues. In the 19th century, it was clearly proven that the world had gone through the Ice Age. There are traces of glaciations over large parts of North America, Eurasia, and in the South, New Zealand's clearly been affected by it, and some of South America, Patagonia, had been affected, showing that these land places were covered by vast sheets of ice. So evolutionists have a problem explaining this. See, how would you get Get lots of ice on a continent. Well, you have to have lots of snowfall. How do you get lots of snowfall? You need clouds. How do you get lots of clouds? You need evaporation. Now, what do you need for evaporation? You need some warm water. So the problem for evolution is all their theories of Ice Age have the whole Earth cooling down some sort of cosmic cycles going on. But you see, if you cool the whole Earth down, you're going to cool the ocean down, which means less evaporation, which means you don't get the ice on top of the continents that you need. So what you have to have for the Ice Age is a warm ocean, but somehow you have to cool the continents down at the same time. And this is actually what would happen after the flood, because in the flood, the fountains of the great deep burst force, you're getting this subterranean hot water like geysers are today, probably lava pouring into the ocean, making the ocean very warm. But this volcanism is going to produce lots of ash and aerosols up in the air. And you know what happens when you have a massive volcanic eruption? The dust and the aerosols block out the sunlight and the Earth's temperature drops measurably. So during the flood, you'd have this enormous amount of ash and aerosol. So you're going to have a lot of sunblock. So you're going to cool the content at the same time as you have a warm ocean. So when you have this evaporation going on, the water vapor reaches over to the cool continents, falls and snowfall, huge amounts of snowfall and covers the vast sheets of ice covering the continent. But in areas near the warm ocean that would be fairly free from ice, and this is where you find the woolly mammoths, see Siberia, wasn't actually covered because near enough to the ocean, so you have the warm ocean current keeping some parts of the world quite warm still. But this is what would happen after the flood. This is the only good explanation for an ice age, and it would have lasted probably about 500 years to reach its maximum. And then eventually the ocean would cool off and the dust and aerosols would dissipate and let the sun through. So the whole ice age would last about 700 years. Okay, so we've got one ice age, not multiple ice ages. Why is it essential that the conventional scientific establishment defend the billions of years age assigned to the universe? 
Well, a very good reason they need the millions of years, because otherwise evolution from goo to you via the zoo could not occur. This could not occur on a short time scale. In fact, I'm going to show you that it can't even occur on a long time scale. But see, millions of years are necessary for evolution. They're not sufficient, but they're certainly necessary. So if you have a short time scale, no evolution. In your opinion, what are the three or four most important facts that point out that the conventional age assigned to the universe is unlikely to be true? Well, my main favorite answer, my, my, the arguments I give the most are things like soft tissue in dinosaur bones, including proteins and DNA. And there's no way these could last the assumed millions of years, which also means the rocks they're in can't be millions of years old. So that really undercuts a lot of the geological column used to push millions of years. Another is radiocarbon. Radiocarbon decay is extremely fast, so we should not be able to detect it in any sample older than about 100,000 years, and yet quite often it's been detected in diamonds and coal, which are millions, hundreds of millions, even billions of years old, but then carbon-14 should have all decayed, we shouldn't see any. So if you want to use carbon-14 and throw it at us, you should know it really undermines the millions of years dogma and promotes the biblical timescale. Could you briefly summarize the things Christians should keep in mind when they hear arguments supporting a billions of years age for creation? Well, first of all, uh, it's the theological arguments, which means that the millions of years views always is going to put death and suffering of humans and animals before sin. So you're undermining the passages of scripture like the wage of the sin is death. Think of Adam. God said, if you do this, you're going to die. And Adam says, well, so what? We're going to die anyway. So clearly death is something new for him. And scientifically, that all the dating methods have assumptions built into them. And therefore, we should not put too much faith in these dating methods and their assumptions. Well, are there any recent discoveries in science that you believe are particularly exciting when it comes to demonstrating that the Earth can't be nearly as old as is commonly advocated by most scientists. One of the most exciting things has been the discovery of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Dr. Mary Schweitzer has been analyzing this for about a quarter of a century now. And it's been a complete shock to the scientific establishment because if these dinosaurs really died out 66 million years ago, as they say, there's no way there could be any soft tissue left there. There should be no organic material remaining after such a vast period of time. But in fact, this has been found in time after time. Blood vessels that are still soft and stretchy, red blood cells, even animal proteins so not contamination. Even DNA, we would expect to find it in intact bone cells. And in fact, she was on 60 Minutes and Leslie Stahl said this was a challenge to the existing rules of science. They say these things should only be not even a million years old. Well, hang on. So it's an admission. The existing rules of science say these things can't be a million years old, and yet they believe a dinosaur was 68 million years old. I think here's a case of their faith in the millions of years overriding the clear evidence from science. These things should have broken down far more quickly. So the existence of soft tissue in dinosaur fossils is fairly dramatic evidence that the dinosaurs didn't live millions of years ago. That is interesting. Are there any other examples from science that tell us that the Earth isn't millions or billions of years old? Carbon-14. Now, people have heard about carbon-14. They may even think that carbon-14 proves millions of years or billions of years. Okay, but what is it all about? See, carbon has a number of different types called isotopes. The common one is carbon-12. There's also carbon-13, one in a hundred atoms is carbon-13. That's also stable. But one in a trillion atoms is carbon-14, and that is unstable. And it breaks down quite fast. In fact, they can work out that after about 100,000 years, there should be no detectable carbon-14 left. So the point is, if you find carbon-14 in stuff... It can't even be 100,000 years old, let alone millions or billions. 
One of the most exciting finds is diamond. You know, carbon has a number of different forms, okay? Graphite is the form in your so-called pencil lead. You know, you can't get lead poisoning from chewing pencils. There's no lead there, it's graphite. I'm not recommending it, I'm saying you can't get lead poisoning from it. But diamond is another type of carbon, but it's also the hardest substance on Earth, apart from the human heart. Okay, now the thing is, that would be a perfect system to test radioactive dating. It's the hardest substance, nothing gets in or out once it's formed. So this is the perfect radiocarbon lab you could possibly have as a diamond crystal. But the diamonds are alleged to be over a billion years old. But when they take you to the radiocarbon lab, carbon-14 has been detected in every one of them. But that means the diamonds couldn't have existed even 100,000 years, let alone a million, let alone a billion years. But that means the rocks they're in can't be over 100,000 years. I'm not saying they are 100,000 years, I'm saying they couldn't be any older than that. So it's an upper limit, which is far less time than evolution needs. The half-life of carbon is what they usually talk about. It's a time for half of stuff to decay. So after one half of half of it's left, after two half-life is only a quarter of it left, half of a half. After three half-lives is half of a half of a half, which is one eighth, okay? And the half-life of carbon is 5,730 years. And therefore, from the mathematics, it's called exponential decay. You can calculate that after 100,000 years, there should be no detectable carbon left. In fact, you can work out if the whole Earth was full of carbon-14, nothing but carbon-14, under a million years, there should be nothing left of that. Well, I think that's an excellent observation, Dr. Sarfati. So many times, it can be easier to go along with preconceived notions than to follow wherever the evidence itself may lead. So, Dr. Sarfati, I'm sure the Anchored by Truth audience would like to know a little bit about how long you've been involved with Creation Ministries International and how you got started with them. Oh my goodness, I've been involved with them for a long time now. I actually joined CMI in 1996, but I've been interested in the creation issue for some time. I went through science at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And in my first year, I did, some, I did a whole geology class in my first year. And the head of paleontology told the class, the fossil record does not support Darwinian evolution. It seems to support a series of divine creations. Now, he said he wasn't a divine creation, and he had to try to explain it away. But it's interesting that the actual evidence in the fossil record did not support evolution. And then, in my chemistry class, I was learning things in chemistry that contradicted the idea that life could have come from non-living chemicals. I mean, in so many different ways, the chemistry is going in the wrong direction. Now, in my PhD time, the head of organic chemistry actually asked me to give a lecture on the origin of life. He gave three lectures pro-chemical evolution. I gave one lecture against it, and he admitted if a vote were taken, he would have come off worse. But it really wasn't too hard. I was using what I'd learned in his courses to refute his arguments for chemical evolution. What resources would you recommend for Christians who want to study the scientific problems with a billions of years age for the universe? Okay, well, readers can go online right now to creation.com. And one thing you've had with creation.com, you have a search button, you can find out articles on a topic you want. But also we have a frequently asked questions page. So we have one page on radioactive dating. We have another page on the age of the earth, the young age. We also have a page on Genesis, just questions on Genesis. And there's a page on some of the long age ideas that some well-meaning but misguided Christians have have proposed to try to add millions of years to the Bible. But also we have a book like Greatest Hoax on Earth, which goes into two different things. One is why the claims for long Earth do not work. And the other is here are some evidence for a much shorter age. And we have Evolution's Achilles Heel, which is both a, it's a book and a DVD with nine PhD scientists in the book writing in their own field, including a nuclear physicist writing about radioactive dating. But there's a video, which is one of the best we have, with 15 PhD scientists discussing these issues. So the big takeaway from our discussion today is that conventional dating methods have fatal flaws that compromise their reliability for assigning dates to the distant past. This means that the conclusion we get from Genesis, that the Earth is thousands rather than billions of years old, is amply supported by scientific evidence. Dr. Sarfati, 
We'd really like to thank you for joining us on Anchored by Truth today. Just as a reminder to our audience, this show, as well as all our Anchored by Truth episodes, will be available by podcast shortly after the broadcast airing. So any listener today who has a friend or study group that could benefit from Dr. Sarfati's depth of knowledge can go to their favorite podcast app and search on Anchored by Truth by Crystal Sea Books. Today, for our closing prayer, how about if we pray for the restoration of the worship of the one true God throughout our land and the world? Prayer for Restoration of the Worship of the One True God Lord of Destiny, God of Holiness, You ordained the fate of men and nations before the cornerstone of creation was laid. You are blameless in all your acts and commands, and therefore what you ordain must come to pass. Who among men can resist your will? What you sovereignly declare will happen. We rejoice that our hope rests in the power and mercy of an almighty God, and not in lesser beings. Lord, you know far better than we the blight that has come upon this nation. We have turned from honoring your name and seeking your will to self-exaltation and celebrating our rebellion. We cannot imagine how this must grieve you and give you justifiable cause for rebuke and reproof. We pray that you would raise up in our midst godly men and women who will be the leaders and teachers in a national renewal We know that you have preserved a faithful remnant for yourself because you have assured us that the gates of hell cannot prevail against your church. We praise you that Christ Jesus himself makes intercession for us while he sits at your right hand. We praise him and offer this and all prayers in his holy name. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we'll continue our discussion with Dr. Sarfati, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in also, or listen to the podcast version of this show. Crystal Sea Books would like to make sure that all the Anchored by Truth listeners know that if they enjoy listening to the prayers that are presented at the end of each episode, those prayers are available for individual use from Amazon. There are two different prayer albums available. One album is Prayers for Family and Friends, and another is Prayers About Faith and Freedom. Those prayers can make a thoughtful centerpiece of daily devotions, or they can be used with Bible study groups or small group meetings. There are even prayers for friends who are sick or about to undergo medical procedures that you can share with those who are experiencing difficult moments. Sometimes it's hard to find just the right words to speak to people or even to speak to the Lord. These earnest and thought-provoking prayers can help, not to be substitutes for your own fervent prayers, but as a sort of friend to come alongside and let you know that others have walked through the valley too. The individual prayers, or an entire album, are available for a modest fee, and all the funds go to support the work of bringing the truth of Scripture to our current culture. To find the prayer albums, Just go to Amazon and search on Purposeful Prayers to find either the Faith and Freedom album or the Family and Friends album. You can also find R.D. Fierro's meditational and devotional book on prayer, which is also entitled Purposeful Prayers, Learning to Pray Like Jesus. As R.D. says in the book, the whispered prayer that stirs the hand of God is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. It's time for all of us to come boldly before the throne of grace, and all of us, and anchored by truth, would like to encourage everyone to be blessed by God's amazing grace. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com, where we're not famous, but our boss is.